Hello everyone and welcome inside another edition of In The Hot Seat. I am Joanne Lewis and today I'm interviewing a very, very important person in this community. I'm talking about the Prime Minister of St. Martin, the leader of the National Alliance Party. Let me say welcome to the program In The Hot Seat, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you, Joanne. It's a pleasure being here and uh, through you to talk to uh, the people of St. Martin, the people abroad, um, wherever this program, you know, is reaching. Mm -hmm. And in particular to the voters who will cast their vote on the 26th of September in the upcoming elections. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, everyone that comes here, I normally ask them who they are and tell us a little bit about yourself. But I don't need to do that because Mr. Wa Mr. William Marlin has accomplished so much, has done so much for this community and has always been in the media. So I want to get into the questioning one time. But before we start the questioning, I just want to say for the 20 years that I've been living in St. Martin, I always hear different things about the leaders or even politicians on this island. And the thing that I hear about William Marlin is he's arrogant. He is not um, one that you can easily talk to. Personally, I say no, but I want you to tell the people why it's not so. Well, I, I, I can say why it is not so, and then they may not believe it, and I can say the reason why it is said. And speaking on a program earlier uh, this week on PJD2 with um, Mr. Cole Grand Lumley, I compared, you know, the days when Vance James, the late Vance James, was leader of the SPM-SPA in those days. And particularly when we started in 1978, uh, the then uh, now late uh, Claude Watty told the people, don't vote for Vance because he is a foreigner. And Vance was born right here in St. Martin. Then he told people, um, if you vote for Vance, he's going to deport all foreigners. If you vote for Vance, he's going to take away your passport. And there is nothing to say about William Ireland. Uh, if you tell the truth, you'll, you'll know he is a warm, nice guy, a friendly guy, an outgoing guy who loves to cook, mm -hmm. but a very shy person. Right. Um, other than that, um, there is nothing you know, negative to say about him. So what do you do? Uh, you say, oh, he is arrogant. So people who do not know him, um, there is a wall then that is put up uh, when you see him because he's an arrogant guy. So. He's not approachable, you can't speak to him. Mm -hmm. Why that is absolutely not. Um, I see more people in one week than probably, uh, you know, others see in an entire month or an entire six months period. I answer my phone. Uh, my phone is what I call it, a public phone. The government pays for my phone, so there is no need for me to have, you know, a private number. Mm -hmm. If I want a private number, then I should have one that I pay for, but the one that government pays for, 554-9950, is a number that appears on my business cards, is a number that I give any and everybody, and sometimes you give somebody a number, they say, um, okay, now give me the one that you will answer, and I say, well, that's the only one that I do have. Uh -huh. And I have the same number now for probably more than 10 years. Uh, when, I was a, when I was in parliament, I had that number. When I became commissioner, I had a number. When I became uh, minister, I had a number. When I became member of parliament, again, I had it. And when I became prime minister, I kept it. Um, as prime minister, they gave me a number, um, and I don't even know the, the number truthfully uh, because I don't use it. Um, very, 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 very seldom I use the number, I use the phone, I use one number because I want people to be able to communicate with me. I want people to be able to speak to me. I want you to take us back to the days of you being commissioner. Uh, tell us about the schools and the roads that you built because you would find that a lot of people still don't know that William Marlin has been responsible for building roads and schools in St. Martin. So if you can start from back in the day. Well, Joanne, um, <clears throat> my my... I, I, my, you know, my professional life was that in education. I was a teacher and I was very critical of government. Um, I was one of those people probably, in my younger days, if you had Facebook and internet and, and those kind of things, I might have been living on it and, and pounding the life out of government mm -hmm. for the horrendous situation um, in schools. I was principal of the uh, Leonard Connor School in Coal Bay and when 40 years ago, the MAC started their school, um, we needed our own kindergarten. 
uh, because the kindergarten was uh, by, by the Methodist Church, it used to be. So government then um, rented uh, the Daydream Building, which is when you're coming down Cold Bay, the high hill, mm -hmm. uh, down at the foot of it, you see a building there that is like a school or church now. Um, that used to be a, a, a bar, disco type thing 40 years ago. And government rented that to put in their kindergarten school. Government rented Daniel's Bar up on Mount William, um, now a ruin after the hurricanes of 95, to put the public school that fed the Martin Luther King School. Mm -hmm. Government rented a home from the Richardson family in Sucker Garden to put schools. Government rented part of a church uh, in the Arch Road to put schools. That was the norm in those days. And I thought it was um, horrible for the students, for the children, but also wrong for the teachers. That was their workplace, that was their office. If you're working uh, for, for Telem, for Najiko, for the airport, for the harbor, you want a decent workplace. All right. And if you're a teacher, you're a professional person, you should have a proper workplace and show your children have somewhere decent to go. So what did I do? I immediately, when I became commissioner, um, came up with the idea that, particularly in the working class districts, we should buy enough land to build schools, uh, to build a community center for the district, to build a school for zero to four year olds for the working parents in that district, and to have enough land for um, recreation facilities like basketball courts and you know, um, a playground like for, for the students, for the children in the area, and a center for senior citizens. Because I believe that um, the community should not be separated. So should, we should keep our children zero to four in the same area, then they go to kindergarten and primary school, mm -hmm. and then as retired persons, uh, they too have somewhere to go to rather than having one center for senior citizens, let's say on St. Martin, and then we have to bring them from Colby, from Simpson Bay, from Dutch Quarter, from St. Peter's. Um, the people in St. Peter's stay in their district, the people in um, Dutch Quarter, the people in Mid Region, that, that kind of concept. Mm -hmm. So we set about, and one of the first places we bought land uh, was at a Hope Estate, oh, where yes. the Genoese, the Viva School, is built. Okay. And we also gave land to the senior citizens' uh, recreation center. They built their center. The mm -hmm. land for uh, the, 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 the outdoor basketball court, let's say, was still there. Land for um, the school for zero to four, even though I think it's now incorporated in the school that is there. Mm -hmm. um, recently, the Minister of Education um, had a basketball court built at the school. We bought land in Dutch Quarter, um, where the Seventh-day Adventists had bought to build a church uh, through a creative a swap and purchase. We gave them an amount of land in Belvedere and we bought the land from them in the heart of Dutch Quarter where the Dr. Martin Luther King School is built now. All right. um, there also we provided property for the community center and it was built at the time and it is there and is functioning in the community. A few years ago when we were back in government we ensured that the basketball court was built there and the parking lot you know for the school and the community center it was added as well we bought land in belvedere to build the homes but secured property as well for school recreation center community center and there too the community center was built we bought land in colby from the clark's family uh, to build the school that's where the new leonard connor school is, is now built. Mm -hmm. There's a basketball court that needs, uh, you know, upgrading and renovation. And I know it has the attention of Minister Silveria Jacobs. And land was provided also for a community center. The, I think the issue there had been that the Colby Community Center Foundation wanted, you know, government to give them the land and they would secure the funding themselves because in those days, it was very difficult for government to come up with the funding and the financing because government couldn't borrow any money. Okay. Getting money uh, through d um, Dutch development aid was always cumbersome. Uh, most of it went to Curacao, and therefore projects like these simply 
uh, it was difficult to get him off the ground. Um, so with that vision, uh, we bought and bought land for not just a school, but for a community development in all, particularly the working class areas. And that, is, that, that was, you know, part of what I think uh, we needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, besides that, when, um, you know, I got in government another time, the government before us had closed down Leonard Connor, the old Leonard Connor School yes. on the Union Road. I, I immediately reopened the school mm -hmm. and um, it became the Charles Leopold Bell School. And it was for um, children who were undocumented, giving yes. them an opportunity to attend school because I believe that if children are born here and they're allowed to live here because their parents are working here, um, whether their status is not yet legalized, I think uh, you know, the slogan education. of the Negro College Fund, a brain is a terrible thing to waste. Exactly. I think it's applicable anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and be because when I, when I look at children who had passed through our system, that when they were living in their earlier years on St. Martin, being undocumented, but today, uh, there was one example that I use so very often, a young lady who went on uh, to become a uh, holder of a Dutch passport and studied medicine in Groningen in Holland. Uh, there's another Surinamese girl who came here with her parents. Uh, the father was working at Maho, uh, undocumented at the time. Uh, Sophia's camp, actually, yes. uh, in Colby, used to accommodate them. And when they kind of graduate from there, we would take them uh, so that they can uh, pass the exam through our system to get into high school. And one of them uh, went on to study law. And when she was doing her internship, came to St. Martin, uh, you know, for her internship on St. Martin. And they are just one or two examples of the many children who were born here or came here with their parents when they were three, four years old. And uh, under certain administrations were denied access to education. And long before I got into uh, politics, I can remember the governor at the time asking me as principal of the school in Cold Bay to give them a list of undocumented children in the school uh, because they had no right to be in school. And my response to it was that, you know, I don't work for the immigration. I'm an educator and I provide education. If government wants to deport the children, then deport their parents. And by deporting their parents, you deport the family. But I'm not going to see children sitting under a tree, hanging around on a wall, hanging around by a supermarket, or simply walking the street, um, being a nuisance. Right. Because they're undocumented and therefore cannot attend school. It would mm -hmm. be like a doctor telling a patient who comes to see them with a big gash on their foreign, yeah, I can't no stick money. your child's <laughs> um, foreign because your child is not documented. Your child don't live here. Um, that would be a crime. And the same thing I see you know, in terms of education. So building, building schools is one of my passions. Then one of the other things that you mentioned was the roads. Mm -hmm. um, main roads on St. Martin were hardly even uh, maintained. If we go back to the, to the years before I started that, the main road from the airport coming over Colby Hill was riddled with potholes. Mm -hmm. Town used to be in, in, in a deplorable condition. Backstreet and Front Street. Um, Backstreet and Front Street were, were horrible, mm -hmm. but hardly any main road was paved. Street lighting was sparsely uh, distributed over the island and only on the main roads. And I immediately, the first time I got in government, started paving the roads in Cahill. And the response from the opposition then was, um, the minister, the commissioner is doing illegal things because he's using public funds to pave private roads because the roads in Cahill are private. I said, well, if the public is using them, you know, to connect from one area to the other, then they can't be no private roads. We paved roads in Cahill. Then uh, following that, in another period, we started a road paving crew. We took a crew of um, men who worked for public works mm -hmm. and for measly salaries. 
And we told a contractor, we will do a public-private partnership. The contractor will be the one in charge of paving the roads on the condition that they take the crew from public works and hire them as uh, workers, temporary workers of the company, but at market, value market rate. So guys who were making like three and 400 guilders a King Sena every mm -hmm. two weeks, suddenly now was making uh, eight to nine hundred dollars um, for two weeks uh, because they were paid according to you know contractors prices but it were also compensated for the long hours they work the myth that public works people didn't like to work or government workers didn't like to work or local people were lazy was thrown out the door and anybody who live like in St. Peter's in South Reward in Saunders in 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 K -Hill. in K Hill, wherever those roads were paved by that crew, mm -hmm. they would tell you those guys were out there five o'clock in the morning, and they would rot concrete until you know the last man drops, so to speak. They worked hard. Uh, they did a tremendous job. Um, putting up street lights was also part of programs that I started, and building roundabouts on St Martin was also something that I thought, uh, you know, would alleviate traffic. So yes, there's. There's so much to talk about mm -hmm. in terms of uh, what William Ireland has done. Um, one of the things also that today, you know, people take for granted, a lot of focus is on the dump and the garbage and the garbage and the dump. But when I got in government, um, there were no garbage bins. Government nor contractors provided any garbage bins. There were some people who would go by GBE, uh, by the power plant in Cold Bay, and take uh, discarded drums, the, the drums that the oil came yes. in, mm -hmm. and they would you know, cut out the, the top, top and make that their garbage bin. Other people took like four or five pallets, nailed them together, and that was like their garbage bin. And in some areas, people who could afford it, they would have uh, a welder build, like a little metal cage, mm -hmm. and that is what they would put their garbage in. But the island was literally strewn with garbage. And after the hurricanes of um, 95, when I got in government again, um, I wrote a proposal for a program, and we got Dutch, the Dutch to fund it. And um, part of the program was to design a mascot. And... Um, Several local marketing firms and company um, persons took part in it. And we ended up with the design of the Mighty Bin. Uh, it was like a, a Superman type uh, character who represented a Mighty Bin. And the slogan was, uh, take pride, don't throw it outside. And with that, we started to sensitize people that you should take pride and don't just throw your bottle through the window. Don't throw your garbage outside. Don't put your garbage on the roadside. Mm -hmm. And government then started importing bins. And today, it's a normal thing to have a bin. And if you don't have a bin, you complain yes. and you raise hell. Um, and that is why I have publicly uh, endorsed and supported the program started by uh, Clean St. Martin with Bikey Mendes, who put the recycling bin on, on, on the pond, fill across from... Uh, Is it Blue Point? Blue Point, yeah. across from Blue Point. And when I first saw it, it was like, yes, yeah, real. <laughs> um, but then it was like, no. And what really triggered it in my mind, one day I was downstairs in the FBB department and I saw a box full of empty bottles and I said, um, Who's turning this office into a trash can? And the employees responded, and Prime Minister, this is our way of contributing to the separation of waste and recycling on the island. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, you are right. So if you come home by the Marlins now, in the corner, as soon as you enter, uh, we have a plastic bin that we throw our bottles, bottles and in. cans and plastic in. Outside in the garage, I flatten boxes and, and, you know, cardboard boxes, if you go to cost you less and you bring home your groceries in a box. Um, before they used to go in the garbage bin, now we flatten them. And now depending on the frequency, um, there's sometimes twice a week, um, three times a week, I would stop and load 
bottles, etc., in the bin. I think if more people would do it, um, but yes, government is working, has ordered, I believe already, the, the bins to put in the different districts, mm -hmm. and it's, it, it will immediately be followed by a campaign, or a campaign will precede it as to sensitize people. Uh, because when we look at the amount of garbage that we put out, mm -hmm. home by us, uh, between my wife and I, we would put out um, a 13 gallon uh, waste bag, bag every day, okay. at the end of the day. Since we started separating and taking out the, the juice bottles and, and the cans and the this and the that, it has gone now. Uh, we have to throw it out because of the food starts mm -hmm. to smell. Mm -hmm. But it would literally take maybe one or two weeks now to fill one trash can. Right. While twice or three times a week, we are throwing and out cans bottles and, and cans and plastic stuff. So picture if we do it island wide, what, what the you can amount get from it? of waste that we cover at the dump will definitely reduce with probably 50 to 60 percent. Oh, Mr. Marlin, I just want to go back to the schools. You remember the, the name of the first school that was built on St. Martin? Uh, the first school that was built on St. Martin, I think, was the St. Joseph School. St. Joseph School. I think it was the St. Joseph I would be school. doing a trivia quiz on the radio station because I want to see how the people are paying attention to what you are seeing. And if they answer it on Facebook, mm -hmm. they're going to win something from National Alliance. Well, well, <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm, the, the, the Catholics were here, you know, um, contributing to education in, in the early, early colonial days. Mm -hmm. And then um, the government uh, followed with the construction of public schools. And you had the Orion School mm -hmm. uh, was one of, is one of the, is not, is, is the oldest uh, public school. Then there was one, I think, was built in Simpson Bay and was destroyed and never rebuilt. Um, but then, you know. The schools that were built uh, were built in the colonial days and by the Catholics, but government itself had not built a school in probably over 50 years. And it's not the local government. The local government uh, never built a school until I started building schools. Right. And, and you see, where did I get my inspiration, for instance, in terms of buying land? There was a contractor, an American guy, um, back in those days, had rented a piece of property in front of the Flanders, um, just by Kings of the Seas Road. Mm -hmm. By the entrance there, there were sheets of plywood. You, you know, they are just recently covering that, you know, the, the, the property that was there. And he built a lumber yard, and his name was Bill. And he had these creative ads, he would go on radio and say, um, Bill is shooting at the competition. You would hear the shots like firing in the background. And then he would say, Bill is shooting at a competition. He's bringing the price down. And it was, then you had um, Adua Bell had gone in Cold Bay where they have the paint shop now. Uh, when you're turning the corner uh, to go to the former oh. Leonard Corner School. Right. Um, Just when you come down the, that's the hill a, there. That's in a supplies. Mm -hmm. So if you come down the hill and make a left. Right. Um, in a supplies. And my thing was, but if any supplies can go in Colby and lease land, and Bill can go in Soccer Garden and lease and or purchase land, why can't government do the, do the same? same. The, the excuse that, oh, but government doesn't have land, government doesn't have land. Well, if government doesn't have any, then you lease just like everybody else, or you purchase just like everybody else, and that is what we have started. That's the reason why today we have schools, quality schools on the island, because of the vision that we had for building schools and providing proper facilities. Well, Mr. Marlin, you touched on it a bit, but I want to come back to the question here. When I hear complaints of the dump daily, it makes me reflect on 2012 when you were the minister of Romy. You had plans for the waste to energy plant. Had you stayed in government, would that be a complaint still or it would have been? Absolutely not. Um, it would have been wiped off the books to begin with. When we go back uh, to to the to the garbage plant um, today, we see uh, certain politicians and parties. Oh, it's a crime! Is mm -hmm. a crime? Yes, it's a crime. Why? Because those that were in government at the time didn't have the vision and didn't have 
what it took to do things right. Um, they, were, they were burning, government was actually burning garbage there on the, 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 the Atelage Road, where um, across from um, Sunny Food, where St. Okay. Martin Sporting Club used to be with Chapoting, mm -hmm. um, there on the premises there, government used to burn garbage every day. And I remember um, when I started teaching at St. Joseph's School in 1973, I was offered a house just above the hill across from um, the printery there on the Bush Road, the, 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 the Herald. And I was like, but why such a big house so cheap? Mm -hmm. Then I realized, well, it's because the smoke was filling the cul-de-sac valley every day. The poor people couldn't get there. Nobody wanted to stay in the home. So I, of course, refused the offer. And then government moved the incinerator and they started dumping garbage in old cars and car wrecks over at Back Bay. Created and another problem. Then they moved in the middle of the salt pond and started dumping the garbage, burying it there, dumping the garbage, burying it there. Because we're in an election year, um, we see people making use of Facebook and other things to make it appear as if the dump is on fire, the dump is on fire. Joanne, I know, and I'm not saying because it happened 10 years ago or five years ago or four years ago mm -hmm. that it should happen today, but the dump sometimes used to be on fire like a coal keel for an entire week. Okay, yes, four, five, it. six days, mm -hmm. smoke will fill the entire uh, area there through, yeah. by, by, you know, mm -hmm. um, all down to cost you less. Yes. All in, in um, Bush Road, people could not, you know, town itself sometimes would be inundated with smoke. That's the legacy of the past. The pond was completely polluted because they were just dumping it in the pond. And in 1997, 98 I think it was, I did a project which we call the isolation of the dump. Mm -hmm. And you know sometimes when you see the gardener is going to plant somewhere, they would put like a black lining, a black canvas lining like, and then to prevent uh, all kind of weed to grow in between the plants. So. I, you know, I didn't do it in terms of doing the work physically, but it's a project commissioned uh, on my responsibility then, and it was the isolation of the dump. So we put like a black lining, a canvas lining to prevent further seepage into the pond and closed off an area, and it was then, in 1997, I think it was, um, decided that for 10 years, we can continue to use the landfill mm -hmm. um, and it would have been safe, but after that we should find an alternative. That's an, that's an 10 years after 1997 would bring us to 2007. Right. We are now heading to 2017, 2017. so we are yeah. 10 years past that. But what has happened after the isolation of the dump? Um, salt started to ferment here and there, but more importantly, mangroves started to grow. The pelicans came back, the pond birds came back, fishes started to flourish in the, in, in the pond, not fishes that we recommend people to go and eat, but it was clear that the pond was cleaning, you know, cleaning itself again because of the pollution was contained. Now in 2012-13, I put a terms of reference together for a waste to energy plant where the focus was on we are looking for someone who has the technology, mm -hmm. who, who has the funding, and we will give them a concession for 25, 30 years to operate the facility. It generates electricity, and the electricity that you generate will be sold to GEBE in what they call a power purchase agreement. So there will be an agreement between the company and GBE, and that is how they would make their money back and recover their investment that they made and make a profit. We held a pre-selection and then a public bid. 
I think um, four companies or five companies, I think it was four, eventually submitted a proposal. Mm -hmm. We had a technical team uh, supported by external consultants and uh, Kendall Dupasoy was working in my office at the, at time. the time. He was yes. on he was on the team. Uh, Louis Brown and Vromi was on the team. Um, Tonsha Boncampo from Vromi were also on the team, and some external people. The feedback that I got was that there was one company that was exceptionally well in their proposal and pricing, and by August we should have everything wrapped up to sign a contract to start the construction of the facility. That was 2013. We uh, were put out of government and left government in May, May or June 2017, and then it went dead. 2013. We heard nothing else again until in 2014 mm -hmm. or 15, we started hearing that uh, the government had transferred everything to GBE, and GBE was looking for somebody in Santo Domingo, and they had tried some deal, and there were this, and there were that, and there were the other. All kind of uh, rumors. Our process was transparent above the table. This year, I went together with the minister of uh, Vromi, mm -hmm. Minister Angel Myers, along with Alex Dekos. We went to New York. We went also to West Palm Beach. We looked at a plant operated by a company, Covanta, that has um, quite a number of plants operating for quite some years uh, throughout the United States. Uh, the one uh, that we went to look at was one in Long Island, actually not too far from where my sister has lived for many years. And I drove by every year. Uh, I go to Long Island, I would drive by the plant and didn't realize it was a waste energy plant. I just saw the long chimneys uh, with the vapor coming out. It looked like smoke, but it is yeah. vapor. And uh, they sent us within two to three weeks, they had sent us a memorandum of understanding, a draft memorandum of understanding. And as soon as we signed that, or, well, we will sign it as is, um, legal advice is now being provided to um, reach to an agreement, let's say, between government and themselves. Once that is done mm -hmm. and we finalize negotiations, it would take, Joanne, another three years for the plant to become operational if we would enter an agreement with them. So it would take three years for a plant to become operational. In the meantime, we would have to continue making sure that that m mountain Mon yeah, of garbage, that monster of garbage doesn't continue to grow. And by separating the garbage, we will reduce the amount of garbage that we take there and therefore we'll be able to contain uh, the mess that we have there. This has been part one of In the Hot Seat with yours truly. Of course, we were talking to the Prime Minister, Mr. William Marlin. Stay tuned for part two.